wasn't until in my 20s that I went down to the Keys and experienced it for the first time, the, the fishing down there and the diving, really. So there wasn't a lot of exposure when I was younger, but you know, it was, it's always been that place in Florida that's known for its quality fishing and incredible diving and just a, you know, definitely a cool destination. Yeah, I mean, when I think think back on it, I just can just remember the water quality, how everything was beautiful. You know, it seemed like everything was different colors, and the diving there was incredible. The fishing, the dolphin fishing back then was just amazing as well. So that's kind of what I, I recall. 150 miles out into the middle of nowhere, really, just a strip of islands that jet out into the Atlantic, separate the Atlantic and the Gulf. So it's a unique destination where you have flats on one side, on the Gulf side, and then just drops off to you know, a thousand feet deep in the Atlantic Ocean. So you have the ability to target pelagics, and, but then also, you know, you get your backwater fish as well. So that's what's kind of unique about that area. Do you get your bait year round? Not pilchards. Pilchards is mainly like a fall and like a little bit of winter. And, you know, once in a while you do get a year where you can get them year round, but you can't count on it. For the other times of year, like tarpon fishing, we do a lot of pinfish, ballyhoos, you know, Spanish sardines sometimes, thread herring. So we're just, whatever's, whatever's in season, it's like farming, you know how it is. It's all about the pilchers this time of the year. It's all about taking, taking advantage of the resource. You're getting really shallow water in areas that sometimes you may not know what the bottom is like. We went out of our way, you know, it took us a couple hours to get them, and that's normal. And sometimes, sometimes you can get them easily in the first throw, and sometimes you gotta run 15 miles to get them. Luckily enough, we're, we're in the Camus. It has the ability to float shallow. So that's a great thing about, you know, just a boat of this type, a hybrid, where you can get in shallow with the trolling motor, capture that bait, and then just run off to, you know, what people would consider, you know, big boat water. But Camus does it all. And it's great to be able to get into that shallow water and get that bait. Wow. What is it? Screaming. It is, it moves. What are we doing for rigging? Um, jigs, line to line, fluorocarbon, right to the braid, and then some jigs, and we're gonna free line it behind the boat. It gets everything going, and being that, you know, we're charter, ooh, that, that one's got some shoulders on it. That's what you're looking for right there. There you go. Ooh, doggy. Going the wrong way. There you go, Baba. Yeah, that might be a mutton. He's shaking his head like a mutton. Maybe you have a nice mutton on there. You know, I'm not supposed to be lifting more than 10 pounds. I don't know if I told you that. Yeah, well, you let me know, that, Baba. I'm right here for you. If I can, if you need to hand over, there's no shame I need like in my little, game. I need like a like a Captain Hook thing, just to kind of hook the rod. There you go. We just duct tape it to your forearm. <laughs> Look oh, at it's that a button. mutton. It's a mutton. It's only got to be 18 inches, I told you. That's 18 inches. That's 18 inches. So, you know, muttons are something that we catch year round. There's been some new laws, and uh, these laws were passed in order to uh, make sure that each one of these fish have spawned at least one time. The research says that if at 18 inches, every one of those fish will have spawned at least one time. If that's the case, then of course, we're gonna have more fish. There are gonna be more fish spawning. And uh, you know, back in the day, it was common to catch muttons even in the flats. People would catch them behind stingrays in the flats, and some guides still do. So it'd be great to be able to see that come back. Yeah, man, every that's in colors. You can see how it shines with the sun. And man, if you think it looks better now, what do you see the way it looks in the plate later? Yeah, we got plans for that tonight? Oh yeah, he's, he's going to dinner with us. <laughs> we got a dinner date. Yes.
So yeah, so this place right here during the season, if you get here after 8.30, you'll probably wait two hours. <laughs> There'll be a line around the corner. Really? You own this place? Yeah, I wish. I wouldn't be fishing. <laughs> Pepe was gracious enough to take us around Key West and kind of show it from his perspective. Um, you know, and you start the day off with a, a breakfast at a, at a local place, and this place has been there forever. It's a place that a lot of the locals go to. Yeah, so right now for us in the Florida Keys, you know, October is kind of like a transitional period. Things are changing from the summertime fishing, going into the wintertime fishing, so the wahoos are beginning to trickle in. Right now, around the full moons, in the next three or four months, is where they're gonna be there. The culture down here is so diverse. I think there's so many different kind of people that I think that lends itself to great cuisine. The food is just insane. Um, great food, um, great dining all throughout Key West. So that's definitely a treat when you go down there and something to look forward to. The importance of gathering all of that live bait before you head out to have live wells that are filled with pilchards is, uh, is one of the more important things because so often you get to these areas and there's not a lot of action going on but with an abundance of chum you can kind of create your own you know ecosystem and you can really fire those fish up oh yeah. Woo. but you got a seven foot rock i mean eight foot rock right there seven and a half i think this one is let me get mine in because we're going to get crossed off. Oh, oh, what was that behind me? Oh, I got a big bar jack chasing me down. The spawn happens in, in the full moons of April, May, and June. You know, when they spawn, they're pretty much, you need no skill to catch them. You know, it took us a couple hours to really find bait this morning, you know. And, uh, and as you can tell, uh, we weren't the only ones looking for the bait and putting in the time. As, uh, you know, I mean, you can see how it pays off when you have the right bait. I think what you take away from going there and doing this kind of fishing is that there's always something to catch. This type of fishing lends itself to, you know, a type of angler that doesn't have this uh, incredible amount of experience because it's not really that necessary to, to do this. And that doesn't take away from what it is. You have the ability to go out there and catch quality fish and it's not very difficult. You can use simple spinning gear, lighter tackle, you get to really fight the fish, feel the fish. You get to see the fish on the surface. You could throw you know, top water plugs and get a real visual strike. So it's a, it's a great fishery for sure. That's it. That's it, Bobo. What you think about that? Ah. Hey, every time we fish, we get the muttons, don't we? We get the big muttons. Look at that. Look mutton. at this. The, the bite's so good right now. I just put it out right there in the chum line and something came and ate it. Wow. And look, this is a, just another species. We got a little yellowtail snapper, but I mean, you get, you get them all back here. The anchor mode, the, the anchor mode on that trolling motor, it's, it's um, one of the most revolutionary things in the past few years that's come up. I mean, it saves you so much time. You're right exactly where you want to be. You know, there's no guessing like, oh, we anchored up and the current was pushing me this way and the wind pushed me that way. I mean, you're dead on. And if the fish are not there, boom, in 10 minutes, you're, you're in the next spot. So as a fishing guy, you will catch a lot more fish with that trolling motor. There's no doubt about it. You will catch more fish. Key West is not very big, eight square miles, you know, less than 25,000 population. Um, and it was first discovered like in the 1500s from Ponce de Leon who was looking for the fountain of youth. So there's a lot of history there. And then in the early 1900s, Henry Flagler brought the railroad down into the Keys. And that's really what kind of opened the area up to, to tourism. If you go with Pepe, like we talked about these little secret spots, we were right down by the piers. So these piers have been there forever. Um, kind of an iconic spot for Key West, so we were able to walk around the piers. There's these little hidden gems like that where just nondescript building, if you weren't having Pepe or some local, you know, telling you what's here and what's there, you wouldn't even understand. But. This place is called Shrimbo Sound, and this is uh, Jimmy Buffett's recording studio here in Key West. So 
Don't look like much on the outside. No, but it used to be a freezer back in the day, so the, the, the installation of it gives it, for what acoustics. I've heard, it gets it very good acoustics, so. Buffett comes down here, Chesney comes down here. They use this little building right here to record some of their songs. In Key West, a lot of people go there to vacation, a lot of people go there to relax and to party. And they have a Key West first legal rum distillery, place is called, that makes their own rum right down here in Key West. So they offer tours, they offer tastings, and who's gonna turn down an opportunity to go and taste a bunch of rum? It wasn't gonna be me. I was definitely doing it. We are the original distillery here in the Florida Keys. The owner actually got the law changed to be able to distill spirits here in Florida, or actually in the Keys itself. And this is the first spirit that he made. Um, he, we have a long name, the Key West First Legal Rum Distillery, because he says we're not the first guys doing it, we're just the first legal. That's smooth. Yeah, I love that. So Plus, I love nice coconut. Thank you so much. Don't pull Pepe says hi. I will, yeah. He told me to Pleasure seeing that. you guys. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. Thank Key West was once one of the richest cities because of shipwreckers. The wreckers would go out to the reefs and they would purposely change the lights on the reef so that when you would come in, they would run you aground. And then they would go out there on their, on their sailboats, on their boats, and they, would, uh, they had salvage rights. They would save your life and they would take you and your crew in, but everything in the boat before it sank, it would belong to them. Well, these wrecks are little oasis out in the middle. of you, you can have giant sand patches for miles and there's nothing to hold fish. If you have this artificial reef sitting out in the middle of nowhere, um, it's just an area of protection for a lot of the smaller species of fish. And it's amazing the amount of life that just gathers and congregates around these wrecks. Ah, look at him chasing that pilchard. Back here, they can be tough to catch. Um, it wasn't tough to get them on live bait. We were chumming, and it, it was interesting. You throw handfuls of live chum out, and just like at the last spot, everything fires up. So there's probably not a lot of coaches running around because there's so many barracuda, not a lot of bait probably lives in this area. So you throw a handful of pilchers out there, it fires these things up. It's just so much fun to watch them feed, you know, you got predators, you know, these barracudas are incredible, you know, incredible fish and, um, you know, sometimes here we take them for granted because we see them everywhere, we go snorkeling, they're always there, but they, they're, they're really a game fish if you really think about it and, uh, you know, they get aerial, they jump out of the water and it's always so much fun to watch them feed, I mean, very often when we're on the reef, you know, you got the yellowtails coming up and the barracuda eats them in half and, it's always fun, and for tourism, tourists can't believe it. I mean, they think that that only happens like once in a million years, and when, they're, when they watch a barracuda feed and cut a snapper in half and all that, they just can't get enough of it, you know? They feel like they're in the Discovery Channel, you know? People gotta love that, yeah. Dude, it's fishing this, in this gin clear water like this and being able to see it from well, up top like this. You see the like bite, this. you see him come up and inhale yeah. it. Gotta get, let it get worn out a little bit more. When they're bigger, believe it or not, they're, they're easier. I'll tell you what, man, they go crazy in the Bahamas to eat those. Oh! I got them on a the plug! Um, I was trying to catch one on a top water plug, and, and the thing with barracudas is they like a fast retrieve. So, I was obviously, um, I had some disabilities with my wrist on this episode and really couldn't fish like I wanted to. Um, so I was trying to make some casts, trying to get one. Uh, I en ended up getting one on a, on a Yozuri, so I was happy with that. Oh, shit. I could see that sun coming over me. <laughs> Woo! That was a workout. Hey, Pepe, can you get my fish off my hook? Yes, sir, just bring him down. Easy now. I'm on my brand new Camus 28 HB. 
Nearly 28 feet long, nine foot, four inch beam. It is a beast. One of the newest changes for me with this boat is the second station. This affords me the ability to elevate myself and get a different perspective on the water. The boat's also set up to fish offshore with the taco outriggers. I can fish multiple lines, spread those lines out, whether I'm trolling dead baits or slow trolling live baits. Huge live wells on board. I have two 35 gallon live wells on the port and starboard side. In between, I have a flip up bench seat. I have seating around the whole front for the family, backrest for the family huge compartments for storage, a large console that offers a portable head as well. I have 28 rod holders on this boat. So whether you're looking for a family-friendly boat or a hardcore fishing machine, the 28 Camus HB is the boat to get. Take a look at your local dealer. Ooh, doggy. Jumped out like a tarpon, dude. Man, that thing jumped right out of the water. They do that a lot, huh? It, yeah, they do. In the springtime, they're very aggressive. They always jump out of the water. I had my buddy had one jump in his boat. We were fishing for tarp and jumped out of the water, landing in his boat. I would not want that thing jumping in my boat. No. Too. You know, I had somebody get bit in my boat one time. I hooked one on a pinfish, jumped in the boat by accident, and bit the guy in the back right here. He was bleeding like crazy. This is the biggest one yet. You have to be careful. I've had them jump out of the water. I literally had them jump over my boat before chasing bait. So they are, have a mouthful of teeth that have to be respected. Um, they're fast moving and they get big. They get huge out here. You couldn't imagine, you know, 40, 50 pound barracuda jumping out of the water with a mouthful of teeth right at you. And even de-hooking them, you have to be extremely careful. Um, don't get your hands anywhere near them. Uh, you gotta just give it all the respect you deserve. You don't want to find yourself in a gruesome, tough situation out in, out in the middle of nowhere getting bit by a barracuda. So, man, I'm not sure what it is, uh, George, but every time I come here, the, the water's always gin clear. You know, we're in the backside of the Marquesas in the Gulf of Mexico. This water's usually dirty, and uh, it's always clear. And uh, Certain wrecks typically hold certain kind of fish. Yeah, I mean, I have gotten some really nice permit here in the springtime, and I have gotten into a school of cobia here as well. You know, a lot of it's snappers, there's always barracudas, there's always just action, you know. But really, uh, in, in the times that I've been here, that some of the, what I've enjoyed the most is been getting in the water and just looking at it. There's so many tropical fish, and you know, the water clarity is so good here that it's just, uh, it's just a treat being able to get in the water, especially when it's hot like today. I enjoy the cuda fishing more because I put the fish pole down and watched Pepe catch them all. And to me, that's, you know, I'd call one, I was good to be able to sit up there on the T-top, get that perspective of those fish coming in, firing in and, and eating his bait. I enjoy that. I, I, I don't have to be the one catching the fish. And I, I just enjoy watching Pepe catch each and every one of them. Nice one. Nice. Fatty. It's like sea lice or something on his head. Yeah, a little thing he's moving around. Little parasites. Yeah, that came out good. Nice. Them cooters don't whoop my butt. Hey, give me knuckles. I really don't eat a lot of fish. And, you know, what Unfathom kind of has become is this discovery, not only of the fishing, but of the local flavor, the local cuisine. Talking to Pepe, he has his favorite restaurant that he goes to. He, he raved about it. He raved about the, the sauce, this Berblanc sauce that they put on your, your catch. So we're making the citrus Berblanc. So basically, Berblanc is typically some sort of acidity. Traditionally, the French would use vinegar and then it's uh, butter, and they just whip butter into it. But what we do is we stabilize it with a little bit of heavy cream so it can last throughout the night without breaking. So we're gonna start with a little acid first. All right, so you put a little bit of that in there. That's a little bit of the, the lemon. We're gonna go a little bit of the lime. 
And then we're gonna go a little bit of the white wine. Cream. So right now we have this like kind of low medium heat. So what's gonna happen is we're reducing the cream and the acidity and we're bringing it to something that's called nappe. And basically what that means is like when it gets kind of thick and gloopy. Okay. That's gonna be the perfect environment for when we throw in our cold butter. See how it's starting to get kind of thicker? So we're gonna go ahead and turn on the heat a little bit. It's starting to get there. Wow. I'm gonna put a little pad of butter in there and I want you to just, just kind of move it around, okay? Okay. So that's pretty much it. So go ahead and pour it on there for me. No, not all of it, but there you go. Give it, Volsi, try that, that, that sauce. What's the chef under the chef? He's not here today. Okay. It was very simple. It was amazing on how simple it was, but to have the experience to, you know, to learn from somebody like this, that he, he makes something that's incredible. It's something that I never would have thought I could do, but he just kind of dumbed it down for me and quickly within five minutes, I had this incredible sauce that can be used on any kind of seafood at home. And, and the food was amazing, absolutely incredible. The fish was just perfect, perfectly cooked. It was a great opportunity to go down to witness everything that Key West had to offer. It's, it's really the people, you know, the people really makes it. Um, uh, we're lucky to surround ourselves with incredible people. The camaraderie, the friendships that you make, it's all of it. And that's what's so cool about going to a destination like this. You take away so many different memories. See my golf game? I bet I'm a better golfer than you are. My golf game's on point. Dude, I just had a sick bite.